Aperture friends, this is a video that covers Jack London and his story to build a fire. We're going to go through Jack London's biographical details as quickly as possible, and then we will dig into the story, um, which is a, there's two versions of to build a fire. There's a short version that he wrote much earlier, and then the longer version, which is in the book and which is considered the complete version, um, is is the one that's in the book uh, let's see if we can the, yes the short version was published in 1902 the longer version that's in our book was considered the complete the version Jack London really wanted is the 1908 version Jack London was born um, in San Francisco California in 1876 you see this picture of him right here there's several famous pictures of him this one which is from later in his life in 1903 there's the Yukon picture that you always see of him working in on the Yukon Trail in northern Canada and Alaska that's a few years earlier than this one and then there's a uh, later one of him swimming um, with his wife that I think has stayed popular in part because it's let's see if we can I can't immediately find it right here I think because it shows the sort of funny um, swimming suits that people used to wear uh, yeah there he is with his wife in the like 1900 bathing, bathing suits uh, he was born in San Francisco he grew up there he worked um, you sometimes hear him referred to as an oyster pirate uh, he worked in the San Francisco Bay as an oyster pirate all that really means is that he was digging for oysters illegally um, when he was like 13 14 15 years old um, he left San Francisco in California and went east to New York in uh, there was like a depression and economic panic in 1893 and he uh, as they tell you if you've got the book as they tell you on page 1107 uh, he marched uh, he marched east with a contingent contingent of Coxey's army he was arrested in Niagara Falls he spent 30 days in jail at the Erie County Penitentiary in Buffalo New York um, after his experience uh, marching east he came back to San Francisco in the mid 1890s um, but that experience that he had being arrested and uh, marching after the economic depression turned him to socialism he was a socialist uh, of one kind or another for most of the rest of his life this is in the days before even the Russian Revolution when a lot of American intellectuals uh, and writers were socialists of one kind or another during the time period of the um, the Wobblies, the international workers of the world, uh, there was a lot of socialist causes. Back then in London was a part of that because there were several economic crashes and panics, and especially in the 1890s. Um, he came, London came back um, in the mid-1890s to California. He enrolled at the University of California, but then didn't have the money to pay to keep going to school. Uh, so that only lasted one semester, and it's right after that that he went to Alaska and to the Yukon Territory in northwestern Canada, right there against, um, right there against Alaska, that he lived, and he was only there for a few years. But that is by far and away the most famous part of his life, and the part that most of his famous writing comes from, like Call of the Wild and the White Fang, um, and To Build a Fire. Almost all of his really, really famous stories, the American literature, Jack London, is almost all that Yukon and Alaska stories. Um, he started his writing career there. Uh, in 1900, he published his first real important story in the Atlantic Monthly. And then really for the rest of his life, for the next 16 years of his life, he made his living as a travel writer, either writing about different places he was traveling then or about his experience as a gold prospector and a fisherman in Alaska and the Yukon Territory. Uh, as they tell you in the book, he traveled to London to write about, um, to write a sociological expose. He traveled to Korea to cover the Russo-Japanese War, one of the wars that later people see as leading up to World War I. Uh, he published 18 novels and 198 short stories. Um, unfortunately, his alcoholism exacerbated other health issues, and he died at his ranch in California in 1916. London had had a problem with alcohol dating all the way back. Um, really to his growing up in San Francisco in his teenage years and it finally after about 20 years of his struggling with alcoholism um, it took his life 
uh, as they tell you in the book, London's substantial body of work reflects the social and intellectual turbulence of the turn of the 20th century. Like I said, the sort of struggles between capitalism and the ri a lot of people's rising interest in uh, socialism at the, in the early 20th century, social Darwinism, um, individualism, his combination of urban settings and characters like the San Francisco that he grew up in with all these adventure stories in Alaska and the Yukon and places like that. So there's a lot of sort of contrasts and conflicts in his writing that people like to talk about. Uh, when he, by the time he died in 1916, he was the best-selling author in America and on his way to becoming the most popular American writer in the world. So when he died right before the United States entered World War I, he was clearly the most famous living American writer. If you have questions about London or want to know more about him, there are some Jack London resources, um, some basic biographical information, and an article about his um, adventure, about his few years in the Yukon in D2L under the Jack London tab. Uh, he is also our example of naturalism for this semester. Uh, he is a naturalist writer. You get a lot of his most famous writings have sort of man against nature, man struggling with natural forces, especially the extremes of weather in the north, like Alaska and the Yukon. Uh, you get that very clearly in To Build a Fire. You see it here. Um, one of the things that's important to think about when you think about this story is this story really only covers one day. It starts at 9 o'clock one morning. Uh, and, it, and the man in the story, the main character, who you never know his name, he's just a prospector going to meet the other guys that he's working with on a gold, um, digging for gold, panning for gold. He's expecting to meet them by 6 o'clock that evening. So this story should really only take 9 or 10 hours at most. He stops for lunch you know, at 1230, a little bit after noon. Um, so this story, as much as it feels like this big epic adventure with all these, like, things are going good and then they obviously turn really bad it really only covers one really intense day what's what's most intense about this day and this is part of what makes this a naturalist story is it is super super cold it is as the story tells you pretty early on um, it is 75 degrees or so below zero so it's a it's roughly a hundred degrees below freezing um, if you freezing is 32 degrees and it's 75 below, so it's like 100. Um, what is that? 107, 108 degrees below freezing. Um, you see at the beginning, at the very beginning of this story, day had dawned cold and gray when the man turned aside from the main Yukon Trail. He climbed the high earth bank where a little traveled trail led east through the pine forest. Uh, the Yukon Trail is a little deceptive here because what that is is the Yukon River. You can see the Yukon River in this picture. Um, it is a giant river that runs f um, from northwestern Canada all the way across Alaska and then into the ocean, into the Pacific Ocean, the Bering Strait there. It is called the Yukon Trail though because in the winter you can walk. It's the clearest, most obvious path flowing through there. Which, so what happens at the beginning of the story is this guy climbs off of the frozen Yukon River onto this side trail. He's been coming up the Yukon River and then it's like he gets off the main highway to go on this little side trail to go meet his friends. Um, and so the story starts when he gets off of the river and climbs up one of these banks to get off on this side trail that he knows will take him to where his other friends are camp prospecting for gold. You also find out pretty early in the story, let's see if we can find this. Um, what most people, what a lot of students comment on at the beginning of this story is the, let's see if we can find it, where he spits and it freezes in the air. Uh, I can't immediately find it, uh, but pretty early in the story, as he turned to go, here it is, as he turned to go, he forced some water from his mouth, there was a um, sharp explosive crackle that startled him, uh, and he spits, and his spit freezes before it can hit the ground, um, it was colder than 50 below, how much colder he didn't know. But the temperature didn't matter. He was bound for the old claim on the left fork of Henderson Creek. He would be in camp by 6 o'clock. But it's so cold that he spits and it cracks and freezes in the air before it hits the ground. On page 1114 in the book, um, you also find out pretty early in the story 
At the man's heels trotted a dog, a big native husky, the proper wolf dog, gray-coated and without any visible or temperamental differences from its brother, the wild wolf. Uh, one of the distinctions that is set up over and over and over in this story, and again, this is the dog is alive at the end and the man is not. Um, but one of the things that's set up in this story is the man has knowledge and wisdom and he can tell you exactly what, he can look at a temperature and tell you exactly what, um, what temperature it is. The dog did not know anything about thermometers. Possibly in its brain, there was no sharp consciousness of a condition of very cold. But the brute had its instinct. And so what you get in this story is the dog's natural instinct to stay home, to not be out in this freezing dangerous cold versus the man's sort of wisdom and his knowledge of what the exact temperature is and this sort of human wisdom versus raw animal instinct which clash in this story over and over again. The dog had learned fire and it wanted fire or else to burrow under the snow. The dog knows it's too cold to be out messing around like this guy is, is what it basically boils down to. Uh, it is also so cold, the man, this guy is, dip, is chewing tobacco, and it's so cold he can't spit because it just freezes to his beard um, as, he's, as he walks along so that he has like a fro this gross, frozen, coated beard of um, spit and, and uh, moisture from his breath on his face. At the beginning of the story, on page 1115, if you've got a book handy, uh, he... He followed, he's following this little side creek called Henderson Creek off the Yukon River. He goes along. He's got plans. You know, he knows he's going to eat lunch when he's about halfway there, and then he's going to be there by 6 o'clock. Um, the first big dangerous thing and important thing that happens is as the guy is hot, hiking along, uh, and this is on page 1116 if you've got a book, as he is hiking along, there are these little springs running down from the banks of the river into the river, and because there is this uh, moving water, it keeps the river from flowing solid in a way that most of the rest of the river is frozen. Is frozen. And so what you get are these little honeycomb hollow spots. If you've ever seen a frozen lake or a frozen river, um, you will notice that if there's any moving water, that won't freeze, or even if it does, it won't freeze as fast as the still water. Um, and so what happens is there are these little potholes or there will be like a layer of water and then it's frozen over it and then some snow on top of that. So it's hard to see and you could step into one of these potholes or what they call in this story uh, spring holes and get your foot up wet up to the ankle, up to the knee or something like that. Um, and what happens on 1116 if you've got a book is the dog falls through one of those spring holes and gets its front paws wet. Its paws freeze almost immediately and the dog has to bite the ice off of its fur. Again, you get this example of animal instinct and the animal knows what it has to do to survive. Um, at the bottom of 1116, at 12 o'clock the day was at its brightest, yet the sun was too far south on its winter journey to clear the horizon. The bulge of the earth intervened. Um, this is, there are several days, there's one day if you live in Alaska because of how far north Alaska is when the sun does not shine at all. There's also one day in summer when it is sunny for 24 straight hours. But because this story is set in midwinter, he is going through that several day period where the sun is just not going to shine for several days um, because of how far north Alaska is and how far south the sun is because of the rotation of the earth. Um, the sun can't reach it. So he knows even though it's noon and the sun is as bright as it's going to get, there's still no direct sunlight. Yet, um, at half past 12 to the minute, he arrived at the forks of the creek where the creek splits apart. This is where he's decided he's gonna take a break. He knows he's about halfway there. He can take a break and eat lunch. Um, if he kept it up, he would certainly be with the boys by six. Um, he has to break the ice off of his face. And then on page 1117, if you've got a book, he builds a fire, warms himself up, warms the dog up. He eats um, his, his lunch, which is biscuits. Um, the dog took satisfaction in the fire, stretched out close enough for warmth and far enough away to escape being singed. Um, and then once lunch is over, the dog, again, you get this animal instinct. The dog is like, why are we getting away from the fire? Here's this warmth. Here's this safety. The guy, the guy is going to keep going. He's got to go meet his, he's got his plan to go meet his friends. Um, at the bottom of 1117, uh, but the dog knew, all its ancestry knew, and it knew it was not good to walk abroad in such fearful cold. 
it was time to lie snug in a hole in the snow and wait for a curtain of cloud. So the dog, at every turn, is like, this is dangerous, we should not be out roaming around. Like, you want to build a fire and stay warm on days like this. Uh, the man, in another disgusting scene in the story, gets a fresh piece of tobacco in his mouth, gets his big frozen tobacco beard growing again at the bottom of 1117. And then, at the top of 1118, there is this paragraph, and then it happened at a place where there were no signs, where the soft, unbroken snow seemed to advertise solidity, the man broke through. It wasn't deep, he wet himself halfway to the knees before he floundered out to the firm crust. And so what happens is, he's walking still along the creek, he steps into one of these spring holes, he gets wet, you know, maybe a foot deep at the most, but it's up to his shins, and it covers his heavy winter socks, and it gets his boots completely soaked. And so he knows now that what he has to do is uh, build another fire, take his shoes and socks off, dry his shoes, get his shoes and socks dry, because if he keeps going, his feet are going to get frost, hypothermia and frostbitten. He will probably his, uh, freeze his feet off. He was angry and cursed his luck aloud. He had hoped to get into camp with the boys at 6 o'clock. This would delay him an hour, for he would have to build a fire and dry out his foot gear. And so what he does... He, once again, you get this repetition, he gets a fire going again, just like he did when he had lunch. But because he is a little bit panicked, because he is a little bit nervous, because he's a little bit worried about, he knows his life is in danger if he doesn't get this going. And at the very least, if his life is not in danger, his feet are, he, he um, builds the fire right under a tree with snow and all the branches, like all the branches are just piled up with snow. He gets this fire going at the bottom of 1118 is where he gets a fire going. The fire was a success. He was safe. He remembered the advice of an old-timer on Sulphur Creek and smiled. The old-timer had been very serious in laying down the law that no man must travel alone in the Klondike after 50 below. Well, here he was. He'd had the accident. He was alone, and he had saved himself. And so he thinks back to this old guy who'd been working in the Yukon prospecting for gold for years and is like trying to warn him trying to tell him to be safe um and he's like god oh, you know screw that old guy i he, he's just weak I, i'm young and, and healthy and can take care of myself um but because he built the fire and this is on 1119 in the book because he built the fire under all of the un, directly under that tree instead of out in the open once the fire gets going and the heat gets going up into the trees and the smoke gets going up into the trees it thaws that snow in the trees and in the limbs of the trees just enough that all of the snow falls out of the tree covers like a chunk of it covers him but it completely covers the fire and puts the fire out before he could cut the strings he's gonna his boots are so frozen he's gonna have to cut the shoelaces to get his boots off before he could cut the strings, it happened. It was his own fault, or rather his mistake. He should not have built the fire under the spruce tree. He should have built it out in the open. But it had been easier to pull the twigs from the brush and drop them directly on the fire. Now the tree under which he had done this carried a weight of snow on its boughs. No wind had blown, and each bough was fully freighted. And so what happens is the snow falls from the top of the tree, and, get, and it hits each branch and gets more and more snow as it falls until it just fall it covers him and the fire and puts the fire out the man was shocked it was as though he had just heard his own sentence of death for a moment he sat and stared at the pot where the at the spot where the fire had been then he grew very calm perhaps the old timer on sulfur creek was right if he'd only had a trail mate he would have been in no danger because the trail mate could have built a fire and so now he remembers that old guy and is like oops maybe he wasn't wrong maybe i'm wrong um, and he sits there and, th and he sits there and for a moment when he sees that uh, this pile of snow on his fire and the fire out, he's like, uh, maybe I just watched myself. Maybe this is the beginning of my death. That might have been my death sentence. Such were his thoughts, but he did not sit and think them. He was busy all the time. He made a new foundations for a fire, this time in the open where no treacherous trees could blot it out. So what you get in a big section of the story for the next few pages in the book, 11... 11, 19, 11, 20, 11, 21 is him trying to build a second fire here, what would be his third fire of the day. Um, but what has happened is, but what happens is because it is so cold, his hands start to freeze, his fingers 
Um, he loses feeling in his fingers and in his hands and, and in his feet, especially because they're wet from stepping in the hole on the creek. Um, and so what happens is on page 1120, he has no sensation in his fingers. He tries to use the matches to light the fire again, but he can't even use the matches because his fingers are so frozen. Um, he tries to light a, he eventually tries to light a fire with the match between, he's got the match between his teeth, but because the smoke from the match gets in his nose and he coughs and sneezes his own match out. Then finally, he gets the matches together between the heels of his hands and lights. The story tells you he lights 70 matches all at once, holding them all together between his hands like this. He holds them down to the little pile of brush. He can, and he's, he can smell his own hands burning but he's so like he doesn't care because he's so desperate to get this fire going, um, and he but he and he gets the fire going and this is on page eleven twenty one where there's the little picture in the book if you can see it there um, on eleven twenty one he gets the fire going again, uh, but then as he's trying to put more wood on it trying to not let it go out um, his hands are shaking so bad he's shivering so hard that he accidentally puts the fire out and then he knows he's doomed. Um, he has this one more crazy idea on 1121 and 1122 to uh, kill the dog either by breaking its neck, um, strangling it, or by taking his knife out and stabbing it. But he's so frozen by this point and he's shivering so hard, he can't get his hands to work. And so he finally has to let the dog go. Um, and the dog gets away from him, you know, like 10 yards away or something. And the dog watches the rest of the story. Um, that's on 1122 is the trying to kill the dog right around the middle of the page. He releases the dog. A certain fear of death, dull and oppressive, came to him. This fear quickly became poignant as he realized that it was no longer a matter of freezing his fingers and toes or of losing his hands and feet, but that it was a matter of life and death with the chances against him. And so for the first time here, he realized, so I might not get frostbite, I might not lose a finger or a toe, this is very likely the day I die. I'm going to freeze to death now. Um, what he does, and this is all, this is what takes up most of page 1123, is he tries, he knows his only hope now is to get to the camp where his friends are. Unfortunately, he's still at least four hours away from his friends. Like, there's no way he's going to be able to run there, especially on frozen feet. But if you notice, he tries three times. The first time he runs for a few minutes, but then his feet are so numb that he trips and falls down. The second time he runs, not quite as far, but he still runs for a few minutes. Um, several times he stumbled and finally he tottered, crumpled, and fell. When he tried to rise, he failed. He must sit and rest, and next time he would merely walk and keep on going. He's also trying to get his blood circulating again, keep his feet and hands from getting so numb. But again, like he's getting colder and colder every minute. All the time, the dog ran with him at his heels. When he fell down a second time, it curled its tail over his forefeet and sat in front of him. And then you have the third time that he tries, the third time that he tries to get up and run. Uh, the thought of it drove him on, but he ran no more than a hundred feet. Then he staggered and pitched headlong. It was his last panic. And so he falls down for a third time after only going, you know, like 30 yards, 40 yards, something like that. He falls down and then he just gives up. Uh, well, he was bound to freeze anyway, and he might as well take it decently. With this newfound peace of mind came the first glimmerings of drowsiness. And that drowsiness is the, the hypothermia and the freezing sort of overtaking him and him just giving up and accepting that he's going to die. And then on page 1124, the last few paragraphs of the story, he pictured the boys finding his body the next day. Suddenly he found himself with them, coming along the trail, looking for himself. And so he has this last vision where he imagines himself with his friends finding his own dead body. And still with them, he came around to turn in the trail, found himself lying in the snow. He did not belong with himself anymore, for even then he was out of himself, standing with the boys and looking at himself in the snow. It was certainly cold, was what was his thought. Um... He drifted on from this to a vision of the old timer on Sulphur Creek. He could see him quite clearly, warm and comfortable, smoking a pipe. You were right, old hoss, you were right, the man mumbled to the old timer of Sulphur Creek. And so again, he remembers this old guy who had tried to warn him against being out in the cold. Um, 
when it was so cold like this, who had warned him against going out when it was so cold alone, who had told him to wear a face cover, who was this older experienced guy who had told him to take all these precautions that all of them would have saved him or at least helped him. And the last thing he does before he dies is think, yep, I was wrong and you were right and, and here I am, it's gonna get, it's gonna kill me. Learn the lesson that I should have learned from you is gonna kill me. The man drowsed off into what seemed to him the most comfortable and satisfying sleep he had ever known. The brief day drew to a close in a long, slow twilight. And then at the end of the story, the man is dead, and so the story shifts to follow the only survivor of this, which is the dog. Um, as the twilight drew on, its eager yearning for the fire mastered it, and with a great lifting and shifting of forefeet, it whined softly, but the man remained silent. Later, the dog whined loudly, and still later it, cl it crept close to the man and caught the scent of death. This made the animal bristle and back away. A little longer it delayed, howling under the stars that leaped and danced. Then it turned and trotted up the trail in the direction of the camp it knew, where there were other food providers and fire providers. And so at the very end, it's the dog that has survived and that is gonna go on and find more food and find more fire because it has this basic animal instinct that would have saved the man if he had just been like, it's too cold, I better wait for a warmer day. But it's this base animal instinct that allows the dog to keep going. It knows it's too cold. It knows that it needs to follow its base in instincts for food and for fire, for warmth and shelter, those kinds of things. So like you get in a lot of naturalism, it seems like human beings are just sort of the highest form of animals. Um, but the cost of that, of that elevation, you know, they're smarter and they have intellect but they are less in touch with their basic instincts that might save them in situations like this. Um, you also get one of the central ideas of naturalism, which is the world is not trying to help you, it's not trying to hurt you, it's just totally indifferent to you. It doesn't care if you live, it doesn't care if you die. It, it, you know, it's not that the water that froze this guy's feet was trying to hurt him, it was just water and he just, was unlucky and made this mistake and stepped into this spring hole and got his feet wet. It's not like the snow in the trees was evil and out to get him. He just made a mistake of building the fire under the tree. You get that several times in this book that human beings are the highest form of animal and they exist in this world that is indifferent to their existence. It doesn't want to hurt them, but it also doesn't want to help them. And that's part of what nature and natural selection and Darwinian natural selection is about if you know Darwin's ideas about evolution and things like that. You can see them, they've been in, they've been known to the public for several decades now, which is part of what contributes to naturalism. And you can definitely feel that in this story, this human being in this harsh climate and existence and the harshness of it shows that nature is just really indifferent to who survives and who doesn't. And at the end of this story, the dog survives and the man doesn't because the dog is, London seems to suggest because the dog is more in touch with its animal instinct and closer to its animal basic survival instinct. All right, so that is, uh, that is Jack London to build a fire. The title, obviously, there's three fires in the story. There is the lunch fire, which he succeeds at and which foreshadows the other fires. There is the first fire, which the snow falls on, and then there is the first fire that never really even gets going into a fire, but it is the death sentence because it is his second chance after the snow falls on the first fire, but because he's so cold and shivering, it doesn't work. Um, all right, that's Jack London to build a fire. If you've got questions about London, about the Yukon and Alaska and gold prospecting, this is part of the, there's really three gold rushes in the United States. There's the one in Georgia in the 1830s. Um, there is the one in California in 1849, 1850, and then this is the last United States gold rush uh, at the end of the 1800s and the beginning of the 20th century. If you've got questions about any of that, be in touch and we can dig into it more, talk more um, about London, about this story, about the gold rush, any of that stuff. Otherwise, thanks for listening. I hope that was useful to you all and I'll see you next time.